Are you one of those people who feel that that very tongue-twisting, complicated, sometimes archaic language of Shakespeare helps to light a fire in your emotional connection to the character? No? Well, then you're going to want to stick around because in one short session, you're going to feel a stronger emotional reaction than you've maybe ever imagined from fully expressing the words of Shakespeare. Hey everybody, I'm Tim Mooney from the Timothy Mooney Repertory Theater and I'm racing my way through my book Acting at the Speed of Life, Conquering Theatrical Style. We've now posted the first eight chapters of the book on this YouTube site. You can go back and watch them all and if you'd like to get the jump on everybody else, you can see the early release of these videos at breakneckshakespeare.com or even earlier by becoming a Patreon subscriber. It's our way of saying thanks for your support. And you can also track down a wide variety of videos on topics of Shakespeare, acting, and more by exploring this YouTube site and hitting subscribe to catch them all. Today's chapter is longer than any of our chapters so far, but I guarantee if you fully participate, you will feel something strongly by the end simply through the process of fully speaking Shakespeare's words. Those great consonants, which are your obstacles, give you all of the emotion you need if you will only allow yourself to do battle with them. In building a character, Stanislavski suggests, if vowels are the rivers, then consonants are the banks. You need them both. To which I add, or else, all you have is a muddy swamp. Most audibility issues come from actors' failure to enunciate consonants or to sound vowels. Some have one problem, some have the other, and both are just as destructive. We may hear from one actor, who oh, must look in speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous cheats. From another actor, that same line comes out, Oh, those wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous cheats. If we could somehow combine the skills of these two actors, the reading that we might get would sound something like, Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Audiences don't have the words memorized already, and if they did, either of those first two readings would probably upset them even more. As acting happens at the speed of life, we get just one opportunity to say something clearly and effectively. Once it's gone, we're on to the next. As the director, I have to pull these two actors, the vowel actor and the consonant actor, in two different directions. The direction I give one actor will not help the other, nor vice versa. Telling both that they simply need to project or simply, I can't hear you, is not specific enough. The actor needs information that will help him or her actually fix the problem, which means that the directors among us need to listen more carefully. Also, projection is not as crucial as you probably think. My Tartuffe monologue, explored in chapter 16, A Date with Tartuffe, is delivered in my lowest possible tones. But as long as I am clear in the enunciation of each consonant and vowel, the audience hears it even in an auditorium of 900 people with no microphone. I think of vowels as pure emotion, an impulse that wells up inside of us so clear and rich that none of the articulators, the lips, the teeth, the tongue, will move to impede it. When you lean on that hot stove, by mistake, without even an instant to think of your response, what is the sound that bursts from your mouth? Ow! The class answers in chorus. The joker in class will inevitably toss in a curse word. Let's say it's the 4th of July, and this big, gorgeous firework explodes into a bright green, blue, purple, gold, silver, glittery, 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 glittery. What sound comes out of your mouth? Ooh. And then, ah. Always in that order, too. The first being amazement, the second, appreciation. Let's say there's this little six-year-old boy, and he's been digging in the garden, and he's got a dozen roses, and he carries them up to his mother and says, Here, Mommy, I got these for you because it's Mother's Day, and I wanted to tell you that I love you. 
Aww. Language has its roots in these instinctive expressions. These sounds are made the same way in the United States as they are made all over the world. It is genetically inside of us. The cavemen and women hundreds of thousands of years ago made all of the same sounds. They are part of our biological makeup, like a bark is to a dog or a meow is to a cat. Sometimes the trip that words take from impulsive emotional reaction to the dictionary is self-evident. Notice the similarity in words such as woe, moan, groan, alone. Since the caveman days, as our crude humanoid brains grew in size and neural texture, we added consonants around these vowels to clarify subtle distinctions of meaning, and then we added prefixes and suffixes and distinguished nouns from verbs all the way on down to prepositional phrases that reflect more intellectual distinctions, articulating more complex nuances of thought. Humanity may have started out with onomatopoetic words such as whoosh or buzz, but as time passed, words grew more complicated, removing them further from the original emotional impulse. But sometimes the best way to get back to the emotional root of a word is to speak it aloud and pay attention to how it makes us feel now. For instance, as we add more and more consonants, we generate a state of emotionus interruptus, a desire placed in check, clipped off. King Lear rages at servile ministers that have with two pernicious daughters joined your high engendered battles against a head so old and white as this. Lear is bristling with rage, wanting to roar his unfettered anger, and every ending consonant stops him time and time again, reining in the sound that wants to howl from his lips until this line at last gives way to the open-ended vowels of, oh, oh, tis foul. The effort expended on the line itself is so enormous. By the time Lear arrives at his final roar, there is little air to give it voice. And this final desperate moment is filled with the anguish of an old man overwhelmed and losing his mind. Love your obstacles. Vowels are pure emotion, emotion that is interrupted by consonants. If all King Lear had to do was roar out, oh, oh, tis foul, then this would not be one of the greatest speeches of all time. The consonants introduce conflict into what might be an easy or self-indulgent expression of emotion. The process of that conflict, biting into Lear's words, frustrates Lear furiously. Relish that frustration. It will feed you with emotions you might never imagine. In other words, the interruption of one emotion stirs another emotion. The consonants that interrupt Lear's release of pure howling rage stir frustration, and frustration redoubles anger. I turn to Shakespeare. I pass out the soliloquy printed on page 44 of the book, but you can easily look up the 2-2 solid flesh soliloquy. I will also flash the text onto this screen. Here are the only five points that we need to know to make sense of this scene. 1. Hamlet's father is dead. He died under suspicious circumstances. Hamlet's mother, Queen Gertrude, has gotten married. She has remarried in an extremely short period of time. The man she has married is Hamlet's father's brother. The plots of Shakespeare tend to feel distant or remote to us and largely unmoving. They sound like fairy tales, a prince, a queen, a king in a distant land far away and long ago. Might as well be characters in Cinderella. We're going to do a quick internal exercise now. I rarely do anything internal, so when I do, I always like to point it out, if only to make you realize that the internal processes are still crucial to our work. It just happens that we're not dwelling on internal stuff here, largely because our external work brings a sizable portion of our internal lives under our conscious control. But take a moment to just get the gist of the situation. 
Don't make a big emotional exercise out of it. I want you to apply Hamlet's five circumstances to yourself. I'll say them again slowly, and as I say them, just think of them in terms of yourself and your own family. This is almost the entirety of the internal work that I'm going to ask of you today. One, dad is dead. He died under suspicious circumstances. Mom has gotten remarried in an extremely short period of time to dad's brother, my uncle. So, what feelings come up for you when you think of this? Anger, resentment, disgust, hurt, sad, upset. Okay, all true, but I suspect there's one feeling you're glossing over. Let's run through it again. I repeat, more quickly this time, ticking the circumstances off on my fingers, but pausing and emphasizing the final line. Dad is dead. He died under suspicious circumstances. Mom has gotten remarried in an extremely short period of time. The man mom has married is dad's brother. Yuck. Gross. Ick. Disgusting. Ooh. There it is. That's the feeling you were holding back, and that's another one of those pure emotional responses that lives in a single vowel. Ew! Just saying it forces you to squinch up your nose. That's good. Don't dwell on it, and don't torment yourself with gross feelings about your own family. Just notice that it's there. So now we turn to what Shakespeare has to say, or what Shakespeare has Hamlet say out loud. I share this as a class exercise, largely because I expect no amount of coaxing and cajoling can get you, the reader, or in this case, the video watcher, alone in your room to do it with the full array of vocal and articulatory effort that the exercise demands. If you are reading this without a coach to hold you accountable, then the responsibility is all on you to be relentless in your effort to drive yourself. The only one who can make this work for you is you. A dorm room, a library, or a cafeteria probably won't give you the privacy you need to let yourself go. Get some space, either within the secure four walls of a classroom, or better, a theater. Actually do this. Don't read in silence, because that will have no impact on you. It will remain stale and distant. And if you can't take even this much initiative, I have little hope for what kind of effort or artistry you'll be bringing to the process without the director breathing down your neck. This will change the way you look at dialogue forever. First, check in. Stand up. I'm going to stay sitting just for the sake of staying in the frame of the camera. Breathe for a few moments. We're going to take 10 seconds of silence. Here comes our second and probably last internal exercise. In this silence, Notice your frame of mind, your blood pressure, your mood, the electricity of your brain waves, the feeling in your face, your sweat glands, the state of your awareness, the pulse in your throat, in your heart, at the top of your head. Do you have any sensory awareness of your hair follicles? No? We'll check back on that later. How about your mood? Are you bored, excited, curious? Annoyed? It is what it is, just be honest with it, and don't try to get it to fit some imaginary correct response. You can't actually know where it is that you've gone unless you happened to notice where you were when you started. So this is just our moment of noticing. And so, 10 seconds in silence. Good. Now we're going to read this piece out loud. I realize we haven't said word one about iambic pentameter or classical speech or scansion or pronunciation. This will be a bit of a train wreck at first, but we will do this chorally as a group, assuming you are exploring this video in a class, which is how we usually do it, so that we can make the same discoveries at the same time and drive each other forward. We'll probably fall into a pace that works to greater or lesser degree for everyone, so we'll likely start and end at the same place. If we don't, that's entirely fine, even better actually. Some will pause more at the punctuation than others, don't worry about it. Just read aloud as effectively as you individually know how, whatever that might mean to you right now. And for now, 
just ignore the asterisks. Here we go. Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. Oh, God, God, how weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Fie, aunt, ah, fie, tis an unweeded garden that grows to seed. Things rank and gross in nature possess it merely, that it should come to this, but two months dead. Nay, not so much, not two. So excellent a king that was to this, Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother, that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think, aunt, frailty thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe all tears, why she, even she, O oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married, O oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Very good. You got through it. No major derailments. A couple of odd-sounding words. Some of you were throwing yourselves into it more fully than others. Things to notice. How much are you forging your own way? throwing yourself into the reading, and how much are you holding back, not wanting to draw too much attention to yourself in the room? Is your point of concentration on the feel, the meaning, and the impact of the words, or on your need to pass unnoticed? We could stop here if we wanted to discuss meaning or pronunciation, but for now, let's just continue. Phase 1. Rattle the Lights. We're going to do it again, but this time I'm going to give you a little bit of an adjustment. I noticed from that last time through that you were worried about making sense of it all and were a little bit tentative. Let's just cut loose of all that, continue to stand, let the breath fill up your lungs to the point that the diaphragm is depressed and the stomach actually pooches out. Test it. Put your hand on your stomach and make sure that you can make the stomach expand when you take a deep breath. Good. Now take a look at those lighting instruments up there over the stage. I want you to imagine that whoever attached those lighting instruments to the battens didn't quite tighten the bolts completely, so they're just a little loose. I want you to imagine, as you speak your lines, that your voice can actually rattle those lights. Imagine that your voice has the power to shake that light fixture loose to the point that it may very well come crashing to the floor. Fill the room with your voice and vibrate the room. Don't give up. Use every ounce of breath to shake the rafters. Footnote number one. Obviously, if we are exploring this in a traditional classroom, we adjust our focus to the ceiling tiles or fluorescent lights or some such. Now, in order to accomplish this, we have to remind ourselves that voices do indeed have power in the physical universe. Since a voice is essentially invisible, it remains amorphous to us, intangible, unreal. We forget that our voices have the power to actually, physically, vibrate an object. Here's a quick exercise to demonstrate. Take that piece of paper that has this monologue on it, or in this case, any piece of paper you might have at hand, and hold it lightly with your fingertips, about three inches from your mouth, and make about five seconds of random noise. Here we go. Do you feel the piece of paper vibrating between your fingertips? Everyone nods. Voices seem ethereal, effervescent. This is not in any way mystical. Your voice moves the air and vibrates that which it touches. It is only by your voice vibrating objects in the physical universe that you are ever actually heard. Your voice reaches out and vibrates the eardrum of anyone who is within earshot of you. So, what is it we're going to do? Rattle the lights. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. You're going to do what? 
Rattle the lights! What? Rattle the lights! You absolutely have to believe the possibility of this. You don't have to believe that it will happen so much as that you believe it can happen. How many of you are willing to believe that? Let me see your hands. All hands go up. All right, I am a witness. You have all signed on for this exercise and I will hold you accountable to that agreement. If I see that you are not believing in the possibility of rattling the lights, I will come up and give you a little bit of gentle encouragement by reciting the monologue directly at you. I can hear the voice in your head. How can he possibly know what's in my head if I'm believing it or not believing it? I'll tell you how I know. If you are not believing that you can indeed rattle the lights, your mouth will not open very wide and your face will remain buried in the piece of paper. This time, we'll cut away a portion of the speech and pick it up about halfway through at that first asterisk and we'll stop just before the second asterisk. I'm going to back off from this microphone a bit so that I don't break the internet. Are you ready? Remember, you're going to do what? Rattle the lights! Great. Taking a deep breath and... So excellent a king that was to this, Hyperion to a satyr, so loving to my mother that he might not beteem the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven and earth must I remember. Why, she would hang on him as if increase of appetite had grown by what it fed on, and yet within a month, let me not think, aunt, frailty thy name is woman. A little month, or ere those shoes were old, with which she followed my poor father's body like Niobe all tears. Why, she, even she! Excellent. Powerful stuff. As we move on, remember that this is an additive exercise. We add things to it and never let go of what we've learned. Use that strength. Always fill the room. Number one is always what? Rattle the lights! Phase two, make ugly faces. Okay, now, here's the next step. I want you to over-articulate every word of this speech. I want you to chew all of your consonants in the most exaggerated manner that you can to the point that you are all making ugly faces. In fact, I want you to make such ugly faces that if a photographer were to walk in here and start snapping photos, you would be so horrified that you would snatch the camera from his hands, rip the memory card from the camera, dash it to the ground, and crush it under your heel. Now here is the biggest problem that I see with young teenage actors. You're all, most of you, too damn pretty. Seriously. I work with actors whose faces look like they're made of porcelain or marble and will break if they were to actually flex or contract a muscle or if their lips should move. They've chosen role models who they believe they should look like and their faces freeze in the positions of the images that they've chosen for themselves the way that seems pretty to them. Footnote number two. More about this in chapter 23, being cool. Here for once, we are going to determine your success on how ugly you can get. In fact, we deduct points for being pretty. It's limiting your emotional responsiveness. This time, as I walk amongst you, when I see your porcelain or marble faces, I will come up to you and holler, you're too pretty. Until such time as you stop clinging desperately to your shockingly good looks. So goal number two for us is to make ugly faces. Say it with me. You're going to do what? Make ugly faces. What? Make ugly faces. Shakespeare gives you some pretty exciting consonants to chew on. These are gifts to you from a man who lived 400 years ago. Accept them and take advantage of them. Make the muscles in your face work much, much harder than you otherwise ever would. And remember, we're making ugly faces, not just for the sake of making ugly faces, but in service of the consonants. Taking it from the second asterisk, this time on down to the fourth asterisk, about 
three and a half lines from the end. Taking a deep breath, here we go. A little month or ere those shoes were old with which she followed my poor father's body, like Niobe all tears, why she, even she, oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules, within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flush in her galled eyes, she married. Great. Fantastic. You eased up on rattling lights as you exaggerated consonants, but you're really starting to heat up those words. But I gotta say, some of you are still suspiciously pretty. Phase three. Spit. Okay, you're doing great but you're still holding back in one area. Just one major thing keeping you from being fully self-expressed. You're holding a little tension here in your lower lip, in the sides of your cheeks, your jaw, your tongue, and along the lower ridge of your gums and your soft palate. As you've been speaking, there's been a tiny puddle of saliva gathering behind your lower ridge of teeth. And you have been working very, very hard to keep that little puddle of wetness inside your mouth because for all of your life, people have taught you that it is not nice to spit. This time, you have my permission to let it go. Footnote number three. Obviously, this chapter was written back in the pre-COVID days when this might not actually have been terrible advice. I leave it in place because A, it's a historical artifact, B, it's an aspirational goal, C, a hope for a return of happier days, D, general laziness, and E, the point of full liberated expressiveness is still valid. When we do this exercise now, we do massive social distancing. Number one was what? Rattle the lights. Number two was what? Make ugly faces. Number three, spit. That's right. Now, you will want to place your piece of paper about six inches in front of your mouth, blocking the spray from hitting anyone else in the room. At the end of this exercise, you should be able to feel just how wet that piece of paper has gotten. If your paper is wet, you get an A for the day. Okay, ready? Taking a deep breath and let's go. Oh God, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer, married with my uncle, my father's brother, but no more like my father than I to Hercules. Within a month, ere yet the salt of most unrighteous tears had left the flushing in her galled eyes, she married. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Wow, can you feel the difference? Check your pages. Are they wet? Phase four, the words that drive the speech. All right, here's where we get down to it. We're going to cut away everything that remains except for a single sentence. At the heart of all that is going on with Hamlet is the sentence, O oh, most wicked speed, to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Can you feel the meaning behind that? Can you hear the climax in the speech? Here's the change though. We'll do that sentence five times. Speak the thing five times out loud. I'll count it out on my fingers so nobody has to suffer the embarrassment of starting it a sixth time when everyone else has gone dead silent. Don't give up, but get louder, uglier, and wetter with each repetition. Number one is what? Rattle the lights. Number two, make ugly faces. Number three, spit. We don't get a chance to speak amazing words like this aloud very often. Take in a deep breath, here we go. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous sheets. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity two incestuous incestuous sheets. Beautiful. Part five, 
Two words. Okay, one more piece. We're deconstructing this huge soliloquy down to two words, and I don't believe you will have any problem at this point guessing which words those are. Incestuous sheets. Exactly right. The two most beautiful words in all of Shakespeare. Not because of what they describe, but because of the way that the very act of speaking them makes your face turn red with anger and forces your tongue, your lips, your teeth, your cheeks, your nose to work overtime. It also underlines everything that's going on for Hamlet throughout this speech. All those words that led up to this, that was just tap dancing around the issue. This is the moment where what's really going on for Hamlet comes roaring out of him. And the very difficulty of speaking the words underlines and reinforces the emotional action. Notice that these are hard words to say. Your mouth has to work overtime. There's an S at the end of incestuous and at the beginning of sheets. Say them both. Every once in a while, an actor gets words like these to speak, and his first instinct, at least in non-Shakespeare shows, is to go to the director and say, you know, that's a kind of a difficult line. I'm not sure if I can speak that quite right. What do you suppose we simplify it? What if I said messy sheets or sweaty sheets or rumpled sheets? To which I remind the actor and everyone else, love your obstacles. If everything was easy, we wouldn't have a play. Those great consonants, which are your obstacles, will give you all of the emotion you need if you will only allow yourself to do battle with them. Aside, I had an actor once who, in the midst of a furious exchange in a modern non-Shakespeare play, had the innocuous-looking equation 4 slash 5 in his script. Try pronouncing that aloud. How does it come out? Four fists. That's right. Four fists is how we usually say it. But this actor put everything he had into every consonant and said four fifths. Enunciating and ploding all three of those final consonant sounds in succession. He absolutely stole the stage out from under me every night. I was on stage with him, and it was nearly impossible to keep a straight face. But he might well have gone to the director at some point and said to him, you know, four-fifths is kind of hard to say. What if I just say 80%? This is how most actors kill their most powerful moments. Okay, five times this time. Are you ready? What is it we're going to do? Number one, rattle the lights. Number two, make ugly faces. Number three, spit. Okay, and make it rattlinger, uglier, and wetter with each successive repetition. Take in a breath five times once again. Let's go. Incestuous sheets, incestuous sheets, incestuous sheets, incestuous sheets, incestuous sheets. Now, complete silence for a moment. It's time to check in. Quiet, please. Quickly, before you lose the moment, what are you feeling? What's going on inside of you? How hard is your blood pounding? Where is your breath? Where are your emotions? Are you conscious of the follicles of your hair? Tell me, speak it out loud. I feel lightheaded. I feel icky. I feel disgusted. I feel the hair is on top of my head. I'm pissed off. Yes, perfect. All of that lives in the words. Remember our initial summation of the situation? We generally assess the thing as having a high icky factor. Well, we found icky, and it lives in our voice. Our face physically winces and sneers as we speak this, and that physiological action creates a dramatic psychological shift in our hearts and minds. The emotion comes on with a rush. Every time I come to this line, incestuous sheets has been lingering in the dark recesses of Hamlet's mind as he talks about everything but the deepest, most nagging source of his disgust. And at last, having released this darkest, ugliest thought in a climax of emotion, the genius of Shakespeare follows this line with 21 syllable words, 16 of which end in a hard consonant sound. One syllable words always slow us down. It brings the speech to a dead stop like a set of rusty 
brakes, decelerating one step at a time. It is not, nor it cannot come to good, but break my heart, for I must hold my tongue. Speaking it aloud, the emotion washes over my face, and I am moved, transported. I feel Hamlet in the very hairs on the back of my neck. We didn't force that. We didn't say this is what the speech is about, and let's make it fit this inner emotional life. All we did was push the accelerator on the mechanics of the speaking. We took the dials of the components of speech and turned them up to 11. We took projection, which is rattling the lights, and turned that up to 11. We took articulation, which is making ugly faces, turned that up to 11. We took the release of inhibition, which is spitting, and turned it up to 11. You generated a vision of the way in which your voice fills the room, the way your emotional life resonates in your face, and you shook loose of the inhibitions that were limiting your full self-expressiveness. And there we found all of this emotion waiting there for us. Isn't it compelling, gripping? The audience will sit up and feel this right along with you. You will not be able to read this speech again the way you read it at the start of this exercise. The wealth of emotion that lives in these words will sneak over you in a rush, even without you realizing it, so that by the time you get to, to post with such dexterity, two incestuous sheets, you will feel a wave of heat wash through your face, the hair of your arms standing up, a lump in your throat, a shudder of emotion shaking your lungs. The dead hand of Shakespeare reaches out to you, from 400 years away and points you to this page. Look, look here. Speak this. Stop killing your dog and speak. I'll say it again, perhaps not for the last time. Everything you need to perform Shakespeare lives inside the words that are intended to be spoken aloud. And that's chapter nine, getting heard. Did you perform the exercise along with me wherever, whomever you are? What did it make you feel? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. I enjoy reading them all. I'll be back again soon with chapter 10, The Perils of Pausing. I promise this one will be a little shorter than this last one was and a little less demanding. It is, however, the chapter in which I explain just how this book gets its name, Acting at the Speed of Life. I think you'll enjoy it. Hit like and subscribe to make sure you don't miss any of these. In the meantime, Swing by my special site, BreakneckShakespeare.com, which has loads of these videos, which you can preview in advance of our YouTube videos, plus full performances of several of my breakneck one-man plays, including Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, Comedy of Errors, and even a free performance of Shakespeare's History's 10 Epic Plays at a Breakneck Pace. Thanks once again to the wonderful support of the Crystal DeHaan Family Foundation and our awesome Patreon subscribers. If you'd like to join us at patreon.com slash timmooneyrep, you not only get an even earlier preview of these videos, but you can also find books, stickers, t-shirts, and more. Thanks for joining me. See you on the stage.